Hello, football fans. Welcome into the very first edition of Head Coach U. I'm Brian Fisher with D1 Ticker. Thrilled to be joined by my co-host now, Bronco Mendenhall. Bronco, thank you so much for doing this. Excited to have you on and doing this podcast with you. Yeah, Brian, I feel the same way. Just uh, so many opportunities and I think cool conversations and learnings to, to go through and hopefully add value to anyone listening and, and considering a life in college football or athletics or leadership, really maybe or just life. Yeah, we're, we're going to get into a lot of those topics on, on this podcast. And uh, you're certainly a unique individual being a former head coach at, at BYU and in Virginia, of course. And I, I, I guess my first first question to you is, is just kind of what, why, why do a podcast? I, I think, you know, it's always funny to, to talk with uh, former head coaches. You know, they might have dreaded those those Monday or Tuesday press conferences with the media and, and dealing with uh, some of us and some of the questions that you might get uh, each week. But uh, kind of why why this format? Why, why want to do this this podcast? Yeah, for, to your first point, yeah, I think mostly uh, head coaches do dread um, the the press conferences, et cetera. A lot of times you're finished playing a game and you've already moved on to the next one and you're already working scheme and strategy and messaging for your team and immersed in the next opponent. But as the head coach, quite frankly, uh, most of your media obligations refer to the last opponent um, and Monday's press conference, right? And Tuesday's um, uh, local beat writers, so to speak, maybe Wednesday with national, um, Thursday, possibly at your radio show <laughs> Friday, um, at the production meeting for the next game, you're still talking about the last one. And so I think that kind of frames why possibly the dread, cause you're trying to already move on. Right. But as the head coach, you're, you still have to keep addressing the past performance, uh, until you have a new performance and not just as part of the job in terms of why I do the podcast, um, I think there's a narrative that's not told, um, at least in an authentic, sincere and, and transparent way. Uh, and sometimes what the view is of college athletics and maybe even the role of a head coach or a coach specifically isn't really articulated in a way that um, can be understood of what it really is. And so I think there's so many messages about leadership. I think there's so many messages about camaraderie and teamwork. I think there's so, so many things that are applicable that usually... Um, when presented, it only kind of skims the surface of what really is happening. And so I thought, what better time when I've had time to contemplate, but also share, um, but maybe that could add value. And so that's why. Are, are, are you one of those coaches that has kind of that 24 hour rule for, for your program? It would be less than that. Um, r really, um, by the time the plane ride is over on the way home, most not with the way technology is now as coaches, we'd already seen the film by the time the flight had landed players with their iPads had seen the film by the time it had landed. And really by the time you wake up the next morning, that's about as much time as you're allowed uh, because the pace is so frantic to get ready for the next opponent. The next morning is really when you have to, to have moved on. Uh, if you hope to, to be truly prepared and in our program, um, uh, in my beliefs, right, Sunday was a day off. And so we didn't work on Sunday. Um, and I wanted our coaches to be present, truly present with their families, right? I wanted them to have some sense of balance. And it's very difficult not to carry that residue with you every place you go. Uh, but at least I was working to provide a framework and a structure where they had their best chance. Well, it's interesting. We're talking after week one right now of the college football season. This is uh, based on uh, some some quick Googling. The the first time since 1989, you you have not been involved a, a, as a coach uh, with, with a program, which uh, is kind of hard to, to fathom a, a little bit. But what was this past week one like for you now that uh, you, you're kind of uh, sitting back and, and sitting there on your ranch? Yeah, a crazy, crazy perspective. So I haven't had a non-football season since I was in kindergarten. And so as a player or coach, right? So that's, that's a long time. When you go back to a coaching perspective since 89, um, it's amazing that life still goes on when college football is happening. And I've never seen life without the lens or out without being through the lens and the myopic lens of a college football coach, where literally it feels like almost your entire existence hinges on that upcoming game and not much else is even allowed to carve into that. And what I learned uh, while I was was out roping steers and, and riding with family and reconnecting during games, it was just like, it, this doesn't seem like this is even possible. And so I, I guess my point is um, what's really helped me is perspective. And I've learned that, right, there is a time and a place and wow, is it important? And it's so impactful and can be in, in so many meaningful ways. 
And yet, um, just this quick glimpse I'm seeing while I paused to, to view it from maybe a further away point, it frames kind of the true nature and place where it might be healthiest for everybody. And, and that's been amazing. So Holly and I checked the scores of the coaches on my staff and where they currently are. And we really didn't go much further than that, um, which basically, if I've taken away anything to this point, the people, the people, the people, the relationships are everything. The outcomes are certainly what gets the focus and it's a reality. The financial component, component certainly gets the focus and is a reality. But what I've learned is truly lasting is it's the relationships. And, and that's any interest we had of this past week, week one, even though all the games are happening, we were looking for the people. Oh, wait, what, how, how did... And we weren't even saying the name of the school. We were like, oh, how did Shane's team do? Or wait, well, how's, how's Nick's team? And so it was the people over the place. And, and I think that's a good perspective. Yeah, I was, I was actually just talking with somebody uh, the other day about uh, your, your former OC, uh, Robert and I over at yes. uh, Syracuse, making a, a big upset win for him uh, over, over Louisville this past weekend. Uh, be, beyond just the, the box score surfing, I, I mean, were you actually able to kind of sit down and, and watch perhaps your former team? They, they got a big win over Richmond and the first win of, of Tony Elliott taking over uh, the yeah. Cavs. I, I mean, were, were you just kind of looking at highlights? I, I, I'm just kind of curious, as, as you sit back there, you mentioned uh, kind of going out there, but did you actually sit back and, and actually watch some college football for the first time as a fan? You know, I didn't. Um, it, it was my time was literally occupied with family the entire weekend. And so then I did have a chance to check the scores and thrilled the Virginia one. Because Right. Anytime. I, I don't know. My, my philosophy is when you're a head coach, you want it to be um, lasting and continue to improve and grow and that your work meant something. Right. And, and could be expanded upon. So I feel the same about BYU. Right? Any successes for places that I've coached that continue forward or added upon. Um, that feels really good. And so, but then to hear, as you mentioned, Robert and, I, and my quarterback coach, Jason Beck is with them and to see the score, it just made me smile, you know, and uh, I wasn't drawn to watch. I wasn't drawn to see the highlights. I was just drawn to the places of people I really know and care about. And, and then just the outcome, how did they do? And then I could reach out afterwards and hear from them how things went, not necessarily just seeing it from, you know, the, the five second highlights that, you know, are supposed to um, kind of reflect an entire game. I, I mean, coaches are, are so laser focused, especially during the season. Do you ever, even even when you're, you know, sitting there around the office, are, are you able to kind of flip on a Monday night football uh, NFL game or, or something like that to, to at least kind of catch some some glimpses of something that's happening kind of beyond your program? Or is it just kind of so narrowly focused on this is, this is what we have coming up this week? It usually is more of the second, Brian, where it's so laser focused and there's so little time and really every second counts in terms of your preparation because there are great staffs and great players really on every team that you play. And they're working um, equally hard and equally efficiently, and or at least that's their intent. Um, possibly, though, right? And, and many times I'd walk up and down the hallway of my coach's offices, and even though they might be in meetings with an offensive side of the ball or defense or special teams on their on their TVs in their office, they might have the ACC network going. Just It just runs 24-7, right? Or um, a Monday night game might be on. And so, right, college coaches are fans, right? They love the game. And so many times I might have it going in the background. And so if I came into my office quickly to then head somewhere else, you might hear just a quick glimpse of what's happening in the outside world of college football. But the chance to truly sit down <laughs> and and look and watch not really so you just kind of get the sound bites as it was on in different coaches offices throughout the day um but you really didn't have a chance to go much deeper because there just wasn't any time do you, do you kind of think back to to some of those those first games i i, I mean it, it is kind of funny you know certainly uh, you mentioned virginia they they beat richmond that was that was actually your first game as, as exactly. well you guys ended up surprisingly losing that game to it to an fcs right. opponent but uh, I, i'm sure there were a lot of takeaways from that game in terms of what you learned about your roster learned about what your your program was was all about in that first game i, I mean are, are you able to kind of think back and uh, find yeah. it find a little bit funny that uh, this this is tony's first game and, and it was also the same opponent that you faced yeah i, I reflected on that and i also just in, in looking at some of the scores and 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 kind of getting a broader perspective um a lot of times head coaches they're asked you know um do they really know where their team is and and they'll present because you're asked so frequently where your team is in my opinion i don't think you ever truly know where you are until you play your first opponent and then you um the depth of what you know um is contingent upon the quality of that opponent and, and so there are some takeaways regardless, but then there's some forecasting that still has to happen, 
which a lot of times the difference between week one and week two and week two and week three, that really, you're looking to get as comprehensive analysis and go as deep as you can, as fast as you can to then forecast and predict what you have to improve. And when I arrived at Virginia, and I'm drawn to programs, right, um, that maybe have been struggling and to help them improve. When I inherited Brigham Young, there had been three losing seasons. And um, man, there's a, another a whole narrative about that. And that Virginia is similar. So I, I'm drawn to a place that there can be a difference made and to elevate. Um, and man, did I did not know. Uh, I remember going in to play Richmond and our team. Uh, an oversight on my part, we hadn't practiced in our own stadium much. And I watched them come into that stadium and some of the impact from previous experiences and possibly not playing well, I could see it affect who they were and their confidence. And I told our staff pregame of our first game there, yeah, we're um, we're in trouble and you need to go get with your players right now um, uh, to let them know they're capable. And so even though the opponent we're playing maybe wasn't one of a caliber that should reflect that, um, Ex past experiences and identities can be held on to until there's a clear break from that through either performance or symbolically creating things. And in any way, uh, it took the entire first year for me to really find out where Virginia was, where the bottom was, where we can really launch from. And then it went right from two wins to six wins to eight wins to nine wins in an unbroken growth pattern, which was the intent when I went. And that's that's really what the fulfilling part is. But yeah, I didn't know but I saw it as it was playing out. And I think many coaches this, this week, they thought their team was this, they thought this player might've been this, and then there's surprises and adjustments you make. That'll continue through the year. But that's why I think week one is so intriguing. Um, and for the coaches as well, everyone's excited, but you're not quite sure, right? Where your team is, where certain players are and how they'll perform. And with, with the college age group, which is younger, the volatility is, is uh, something pretty remarkable. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not the NFL. There, there are no preseason games to where you can kind of iron out a, a lot of those kinks as much as or, coaches would, would love that. Or practicing against other opponents, which is, wow, is that valuable? But there, yeah, you don't get to do that either. You're just going against yourself. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, I, I think that's great. And, and we'll get into a lot of these topics, you know, over the coming weeks on, on this podcast. We, we want to dive into your, your recruiting philosophy, uh, mm -hmm. how, you, how you hire staff members, you know, just your, your general approach to uh, building a program, because I, I think it is uh, certainly fascinating given your career trajectory. And, and look, we, we, we've touched on, on Virginia a couple of times. I'm kind of curious if we, for, for a lot of those listeners, I think it was uh, surprise, shock, you know, yeah. I, I mean, you can kind of go through a lot of those uh, type of adjectives, you know, when, when it was announced that you were resigning from, from the Cavs. Uh, I'm curious if you can maybe uh, fill in a few of the listeners just in terms of you know, why why decide, especially after leading the team to an Orange Bowl, looking at that trajectory sure. pointed upwards, why why was the time to kind of step away and, and take this year off? Man, I, I'm, I'm so glad to be able to discuss it. Um, and, and so I, I had been a head football coach at the Power 5 level, um, Division 1 level for 17 years. And, and so that's a, a long time. Uh, it's very difficult to last in college football. It's certainly difficult to last long enough to depart any place on your terms, which I was lucky enough to do um, at both my head coaching stops. But really, uh, the genesis of their idea uh, or the motive for this, this pause is what it is. And it just is a pause. And, and I look forward to to recapturing the hearts and minds of young people, right? And helping them develop. And most likely, right, through the game of college football. Uh, I'm not sure there's something more impactful. Um, it was the first time in 17 years for my wife and I, um, we just sent, I have two sons serving missions uh, for my faith, um, which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so I have a son at BYU, and then here goes my last son on a mission. And it was the first time since my wife and I had been married, since before we had kids, where it was just she and I. And um, I didn't see another window um, of time where we would have this again, where it would be just she and I to truly step back for a season <laughs> to reflect, to pause and say, OK, is this what we're supposed to be doing? Um, um, are we united in doing this? Uh, why would we really do it? And what are the motives? Who are we really? Who are we without our job title and our money? And and doesn't that make sense if, if you and I, Brian, were to try to summit Everest? Right. Most people, there's camps along the way. There's base camp where you're getting all your materials together. Right. And you go for a while. And then there's another camp and you're checking the weather and making sure your rations are good and looking at the, you know, uh, the, the health and well-being of your team members. And OK, we're good for the next one. And then you pause at another camp. Right. And at some point you summit. 
Um, so very seldom is it straight through. And it just seemed to me, um, and I was struck and prompted so powerfully that this is the perfect time with our kids gone to set up the infrastructure for chapter two of our lives um, and this beautiful place we're building in Montana for Holly and I to reconnect. And then we relaunch um, with more clarity, with more purpose, with more um, passion, if even possible, um, and perspective than we could have been without pausing. And wow, has it been exactly everything I would have hoped. Um, and uh, a lot of truth, quite frankly. Sometimes who you think you are with your job title and money are different than who you are without it. One thing to say it, another thing to do it. And so um, what's been so fun too is Holly loves college football. She loves also the process of seeing me working with young people. Um, which to me is is the primary reason to have a platform of college football is to develop the kids that we are, uh, we're with every day. And so it was just simply that, a window being empty nesters for the first time <laughs> to pause, reflect, renew, reassess, gain additional insights um, before relaunching. And it really had nothing to do with um, a given place or record or anything else. It was just simply a, a, a pause in life to to add value. And I would say maybe to then um, assault the summit, right? Not just limp into the summit, <laughs> but then, you know, truly, uh, I would call it like an assault camp this 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 uh, last year of, you know, making sure all the supplies are completely dialed in, right? The fitness is at the highest level, emotionally, physically, mentally. The team, meaning Holly and I are, you, you couldn't get more ready. Um, and there's the summit. And then rather than limping into it, you get to charge into it, right? And the flag's ready to plant, um, not for the sake of self, but for bringing as many as we can at the highest level. So um, yeah, uh, it wasn't planned. It wasn't where, okay, after this last game here, this is going to happen. It was just, man, clarity and promptings came so quickly and powerfully. It was like, okay. And uh, Carla Williams, our athletic director, shocked President Ryan, and Holly, quite frankly, because I really hadn't discussed it much. Um, um, but I'm certain it was the right thing to do um, for the, I would say, not only for now, but for the future teams that um, I'll lead or for the future young people I'll get to work with. Um, yeah, I think they'll get a better version and, and a more clear minded version of someone that was trying to be that anyway. So so many times we, we talk with head coaches who, who do take that kind of year off and, and they, they kind of are always left uh, kind, kind of wanting that they're missing football. I, I mean, Bear mm -hmm. Bryant famously thought, he, you know, he, he would pass away as, as soon as he retired from coaching. And, and that's just what he do. It, do. it doesn't seem like that that's that's kind of in your ethos. But but I'm curious, do you do you find yourself a, a little bit more, even more recharged than you were kind of thinking going into this whole process of, of taking oh, a year off? I'm so thankful. You, you know, I, I think you um, well, I, I forgot what normal. I don't even know if that's the right word. I forgot what maybe healthy felt like uh, or maybe what normal feels like. You, you go to a place when you're coaching and and, and uh, pardon maybe the analogy here because I, I can't compare. It's the best thing. It's almost like being deployed where we sleep at home, but it's really hard to be present um, because of just the 24-7 nature of, of, um, of constant readiness. And I'm viewing it as a privilege, right? And I'm not, I'm not looking for, for to play a victim or being hypocritical for, for the privilege of getting to lead young people through this game. Um, and what I've learned is, is, wow, when you're in it, it's almost entirely results driven. And in this pause that I've had, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of texts have come in, um, all from former players and former coaches and coaches' wives. And do you know, and Brian, this is this might be, man, if nothing else from this podcast, if anyone listens today, um, I would never have been able to predict this. I haven't had a single text that has mentioned a score, a season, a record, a given game, or a play. Not Not one. And I just was like, I'm, it almost makes me emotional. The, all these texts are about relationships. Coach, I remember, um, yeah, uh, when you came to class check and we had this walk on the way to the next one, and I remember our conversation, or I remember a phone call, or I remember after that, after um, or getting off the plane and you put your arm around me and we were walking to the bus. And so it's interesting where the entire focus now, as you and I were talking earlier, were on the outcomes, right, and the scores and how did everyone do really 
all that is is the infrastructure and the scaffolding to to build um, young people and to create lasting and powerful memories to help them have amazing lives. And I was lucky enough through this pause to get that feedback because you always wonder, you know, what impact am I having? And what evidence is there of that? And usually you're gauged only by the record and the score or maybe by the money generated. What what I can share with anyone that's listening um, through the sample size of 17 years, not a single message to me out of so many flooding coming in has mentioned outcome, not one. They have all mentioned relationships and impact that way. And I'm just answering a text before you and I go, uh, here comes a wedding reception and an invite. And I, I just can't wait, right? Um, and so the lasting part of all of this, um, I would love to say, and this might be disillusioning to some, I'd love to say is the outcome. And I know it's necessary, right? And 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 winning is fun. And it's so, so cool to see everyone in your organization happy. Um, but wow, was it fleeting and short-lived, the outcomes. And the relationships are everything is what I've learned. And so um, I want both, right? Just to be clear, we called it and at Virginia, amazing people, great relationships, amazing educations, awesome in the community and exceptional football. And it seems so tilted to outcome and finance. Um, There has to be those coaches and there have to be those people uh, taking this feedback and saying, what is going to last? Um, what I can promise just because I'm living it, the relationships and, and who would, who would have thought, right. And that's been surprising, but also gratifying to me. And so within the next opportunity that comes even more focus on that, right. Not at the expense of performance, not at the expense of winning, not at the expense of having a great um, outcome, but every second possible, the relationships, the relationships, and I'm talking with staff as well, right. Um, that's what's lasting. And that's been my takeaway so far. I even forgot what you asked me, but hopefully that <laughs> answers it. <laughs> no, no worries about that. Uh, you, uh, a lot of people forget exactly what I, what I asked them. So, so you, you, you're, you're one of many on that front, uh, believe me, covering college football for as, as long as I have. But, you know, you, you mentioned those relationships. I, I mean, I think it is unique in, in terms of how you've built programs. I, I think that is kind of the, the one thing throughout the your head coaching career that, that you've been able to do. And, and I'm curious if there's maybe a specific, uh, you know, theme uh, as you sure. built from those two wins into – you know, having, having an orange ball, winning an ACC coastal title, yeah. and, you know, building upon that as, as well. Well, um, again, the methodology is unique and I'm kind of an outlier that way. And again, I'm not saying better or worse, uh, but again, I, I view college football as just simply the most powerful platform that I found to build young people from. And, and so having said that, I go back to my days of being raised on a ranch and um, I, I, I got nothing other than what I earned. But when I did earn something, wow, did I cherish it. And wow, did I, um, did it mean so much to me? And so really, uh, I've, I've run programs based on teaching will before skill, right? Until you demonstrate that you will try hard, you don't get to play the game. You don't get to practice the game, right? Um, Because Angela Duckworth's work in her work, in, a, in her book, Grit, and all of her other work, right? One of the most powerful predictors of the success of young people is how hard they try. Not only once, but resiliency, that they keep trying. And so I've always tried to run programs that through effort, sustained effort, right? Kids learn the game of football and they get to play, but it's really preparing them for marriages that are difficult, jobs that are difficult, challenges that come with their children that are difficult. But if they've learned to try hard and to remain resilient, their chance to have a great life, yeah, they're prepared. And so I was always looking for um, in the selection and assessment, I don't even call it recruiting, right? The selection and assessment process, what predictors were there? And man, in my faith, there's something called early morning seminary. And these kids out of state are getting up to basically go to Sunday school before high school, (laughs) And I remember a story, one of these kids in Hawaii, he was having to catch public transportation and it was about an hour to get to where his church building was and his attendance was perfect attendance. And I was like, that's who I want on my team, right? Someone that's going to get up at 430, (laughs) get themselves to the bus stop, never, ever miss a morning um, 
because that that was so valuable to them and they knew how to do hard things. So for the kids that didn't know how to do hard things, I certainly that was my first goal in the program is to teach young people how to do really hard things and that they were capable. Right. And celebrate the simple successes. And then when they learned to do that, the reward was actually to get to practice football. (laughs) Right. Not the game. But the privilege was this is a game that you get to play, but you don't get to play it until you've shown you're ready to play it by how hard you'll try. And I I love that philosophy of building people through teaching them to try hard. Um, And there's I think there's value in that. I, I, I do which wanna... is, by the way, where, where earn not given at Virginia came from. And so players having to earn um, their gear, uh, they would come into the program with a white T-shirt and white shorts and white socks. And they literally they had nothing with UVA on it. Um, our, our Nike allotment was in the storeroom, right? Looked like a showroom. But as players then demonstrated, much like martial arts, they hit different criteria. They would earn these colors, right? with the rite of passage where they might have to run every stadium step after they pass the test to get their new gear in the upper corner. And man, they cherish that those colors with a V saber on it, like it was gold and anyway, different steps. And so I didn't want to entice them to come by the visors or 12 helmet colors, right? I wanted them to come um, with this idea of they could become someone regardless of what was on the outside that was so powerful and could impact society and families in such a way that what they were wearing was actually, you know, who cared? Uh, It was what was inside. And so that's where the earn not given um, philosophy came, not only, well, at at UVA in particular, but will before skill um, kind of at BYU. And that's just from a coach that believes in developing people through the game of football, right? And um, so I think that answers your question. It, it, it definitely does. And I think it's interesting, you know, people that, that might see the artwork for the, for this podcast or, or see, see the logo certainly knows that there's, there's a little bit of a horseshoe logo on there. Uh, you know, part of that was also, you know, taking, taking kids, recruits, uh, you know, team members out, you know, staff members, even out to your ranch, um, you know, putting them on horses. I, I, I love the philosophy be, behind that. And for, for those who maybe have not seen, you know, why, why you take people out there, what is the reason behind that? Yeah. Yeah. Um... So I originally started at Virginia just with the idea of, of trying to have something distinctive and to differentiate Virginia on a visit maybe from some other place. Um, but what started as an experiment, it didn't take me long to realize, wait a second, this there's a whole other purpose for this. And what I was learning, and, and so for those listeners, you, you couldn't make it into our program without riding a horse um, on your recruiting visit. And obviously there's a lot of work and background work before someone ever arrives on grounds. But literally what would happen is the players would then dump off their bags at their hotel and then they would come out to our place. I lived on 30 acres there in Virginia and my kids and I are into team roping and I grew up in the horse business. Um, And I started taking players two at a time and their their folks would walk them down to the arena. They had to stay on one side of the fence. The player would come through the gate and if they wouldn't ride, they didn't get into the program. Um, But then I would just watch how they took on something new because most had never seen a horse up close. They'd never ridden. And I was looking to see, um, would they approach something new with caution? Would the, would it take encouragement from family members? I was watching the mom and dad to see if they were arguing or if they had their arms or hand, or if they were holding hands, just saying, well, there he goes, like excited for him. And I was watching the family dynamic and I was just seeing really who people were. And without a transparent activity, those are hard things to learn at dinner. Right. Those are hard things to learn during a PowerPoint presentation. It's hard to learn on a campus tour. This idea of demonstrated competencies started to make a lot of sense. And so I was just watching, by the way, and I love to write anyway. So I wasn't recruiting. I was just having a normal Saturday. So here comes these two players and I would teach them the basics as they got on and we'd be in the arena and I'd show them how to turn left and turn right and stop and back up and and just some of the fundamentals. And then really without much fanfare, I'd open the gate and we had a, a trail cut around our property of 30 acres. And I would just take the players out and we'd start on a trail ride. And I'd look back to see how their families were handling that um, because, right, there could be some anxiety. Um, and I would just spend that time uh, head coach with with two young people taking on something completely different, just seeing who they were and then assessing the fit. Right. They could see me truly and authentically in my environment. I could see them in a brand new environment, which is if you go to a party, sometimes there's icebreakers. Right. This would be like an ice destroyer. Right. They're (laughs) they're way out there. And so in a very short amount of time for all of us, I could see and they could see, does this fit? 
right? Do they fit in Charlottesville, Virginia? Do they fit with this head coach? Do I think they fit? And within an hour, by the time we got back, they might be riding the horse like they're coming in from Amarillo on a cattle drive. And and they were smiling. And really, it was telling us all, oh, yeah, this is going to work great. Or it was saying, yeah, this isn't the right fit. What a great gift for everybody, right? And so I was doing it so they could see past all of this, the recruiting, which is the right word, which most of the time is pretend, to the reality of this is this person as the coach. This is how he lives. These things we're talking about are important to him. I could be listening to them just two at a time, right? What's really important to them in this brand new setting. And then I would pay attention as they got off. Would they go over and scratch the horse behind the ear? Would they rub it under the chin a little bit, you know, or would they just throw the reins and walk off? And I was just paying, it's almost like tryouts, right? I was just looking to see who they really were. And wow, did that help us all. And in this world of the transfer portal, um, I didn't want anyone to leave, right? Um, and so I was trying to have them have the best college experience. And I, I think when I, I re, when I resigned, we had the third fewest transfers um, prior to that point. And I view that as the way, um, as the ideal, right? That no one wants to leave because they chose so clearly on the front end. They can only choose clearly and we could only choose clearly if you were transparent, right? And truly authentic and, and laid it out there to what, what and who everybody really was. And so I have no issues with the transfer portal because I think it holds its coaches accountable to how they treat their players, but also the context and how they bring them in. Right. And, and what they're told and, and does it match? And if it does, man, everyone wants to feel needed and wanted, right. And have an impact. And if quite frankly, if you just tell the truth, it's amazing um, how people want to stay and want to be there. And so, and I think college football could use more of that just as a base rule. Um, and that's not pointing fingers or finding fault with anyone. It's just a matter of doing business honestly, fairly openly and honestly, with the best chance for a player to have success at a certain place, right? Does he truly fit and belong at that institution and within your program? And if they do, man, you see smiles a lot. And I loved standing before my team every morning and seeing happy young people, right? And mostly they're happy because there was trust established and trust is based on what they were told and then what happened matched. Um, And I'm certainly not presenting myself as perfect, but that simple baseline goes a long ways. And, and we, we hope to dive into to the transfer portal and some of the other topics on, on yeah. in college football that, that are really dominating the headlines a, a little bit more in, in the podcast in, in the coming weeks. But, you know, the, the thing about this, this is very authentic to you. This is not uh, not kind of a gimmick you stumbled on, uh, over. You, you've you've been riding horses your entire life, pretty much. Exactly. And that's how I was raised. And I, and I, I started thinking, what better way for someone coming into our program to see a head coach, right? They see the sidelines. That's one context. Um, They might've seen a practice or two, right? They might've come to camp. That's all football related context. Um, What does that person really look like when they, if they could pick what they would want to do, what would they do and what are they like in that setting? And I thought, what, what better gift could I give than showing that? Right. And, but also, What more could I learn or what better way to learn about who's coming than to see them do something brand new um, that they've never done before. But I could also teach, communicate and share something that I hope would add great value, but also learn just how we're going to get along. And it took a long time to go two at a time, you know, on on larger recruiting weekends. But how better to, to truly know and connect. And and it was just so powerful and fun at the same time, because it's what I was going to do anyway on a Saturday. Um, and why not share that and show that? And, and so, yeah, uh, I, I just, I think that there's, I, I would use this in the dating world for my, for my own boys. In fact, it's more like tryouts. So you learn very little about someone at a movie cause you don't talk and it's dark and you're just sitting side by side. Um, but my, my wife has this really cool idea of if my sons are going to get married, then their fiance gets to come on a backcountry trip, 50 pound packs in the backcountry of Montana, 10 day minimum. And then we'll see right when that person is hungry and tired and has to fish for dinner. And will they help around the campfire? Right. And by the end of those 10 days, there's little chance we haven't seen if it's going to work or not. Right. And so my team always used to joke with me 
coach, your boys won't ever get married if, if that's the way that this is going to happen. <laughs> but I'd say, yeah, they will to the right person. They certainly will. And, and so I guess this idea of having competencies demonstrated or kind of simulating before, and it's nice to know before you know. And so that's that was the whole idea is, is try to frame the structure to where we had fewer unknowns about who someone really was by creating circumstances to find out before it became real or before you say I do, if you use the marriage analogy. Well, we'll be using quite a few analogies over over the coming weeks as, as we dive into your philosophies and, and everything that's going on in, in college football. But uh, as we kind of bump up a, a, against time, I, I guess for, for those that are maybe on the fence, uh, you, that, that you want to get them in and, and make sure they, they are subscribing on whatever podcast platform oh, yeah. that they are listening to. Bronco, what, what's kind of your takeaway as, as we kind of go into this series and, and what you ultimately want to accomplish? I, I'd love to add value um, to moms, to dads, to leaders, to administrators, to anyone um, that's interested in helping young people. Um, it's one of the most powerful things and purposes, I think, um, that any of us could have on the planet uh, because that's the next generation, right? They are the next leaders. They they will determine um, the course of our country and the planet, quite frankly. And man, if we have value or can learn from each other and to pass on things that are impactful to help, uh, in platforms and from platforms that bring together communities of learners. Um, I'm all for that. And so my main purpose for being with you on this is for this time that I've carved out for this football season uh, to try to add value to anyone that wants to facilitate the development of young people. Um, and I make just to learn as much as I make just to share. Um, there are so many scenarios as mom and dads that come up and it's like, wow, that, that's a new one. I, I've been visiting other coaches uh, at their request to help them. And I just had, I sat down with the head coach recently and he said, have you ever had this? And I was like, Oh no, I've never had that. And we were able to talk through it. I hope this podcast will allow me to share some of the things that maybe some haven't been through for me to learn from others that maybe have been through things that I haven't been through, but it's all through the context of sport. And I think right now what we hear about is, yeah, what realignment is happening and what were the television dollars of this new contract and here comes the college playoff and who gets in. But man, if we don't pause for a second, what is the intent of all that infrastructure? Who is participating? And are we truly helping uh, those kids become someone exceptional through this process? And I'm that advocate, right? That's the way I see it. And it doesn't mean you can't win at the highest level at the same time. Uh, but I don't hear nearly as much commentary about what you and I are talking about versus um, revenue streams um, and things that are are more maybe entertainment oriented. And I acknowledge that and see there's value in it, um, but there has to be this, this groundswell of motive to be adding a real impact along the way. Otherwise, it seems pretty hollow and probably isn't fulfilling the purpose that could be fulfilled if we're really intentional about it. Well, I, I can't wait to get into a, a lot of those topics on uh, with you the over the coming weeks. And uh, you know, um, please, if you are a, a subscriber, please give us five stars. You know, rate rate, rate view. Uh, go ahead and leave a comment. Uh, we we would love to hear from you guys out there. I'm I'm Brian D. Fisher on Twitter, and uh, the first of many podcasts are is in the books. Bronco, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, I, I can't wait till we roll this over to week two. It's absolutely my my uh, pleasure, Brian, and thanks for the opportunity just for me to share. Um, and 17 years worth of, of helping young people. Um, what I miss most in this pause that I've taken, seeing them every day. Um, the young people and, and how bright and vibrant and enthusiastic and capable, right? That is an amazing work to do. And for those moms and dads and administrators and leaders, um, I hope everyone feels fortunate, even though it's hard to be able to do that because it's, um, it's valuable. Well, more to come here on Head Coach U with Bronco Mendenhall. Thank you all for so much for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody.